Thank you very much. And uh, let me say uh, a warm hello to all colleagues and friends and uh, congratulations and thanks to uh, University of Siena, uh, the Santa Chiara Lab for the fantastic report and the great work and all of you for the efforts uh, at organizing a, a unique initiative that I think is uh, incredibly promising and incredibly exciting. Uh, let me make uh, just some very brief uh, remarks. First, uh, thank you for this uh, idea of the leadership of the different SDSN uh, country networks on the six transformations. I think the six transformations are a, an exciting and a potentially a very important way to view the SDG challenge. Because what we're really saying in the six transformations is we need deep and long-term change. Long-term meaning at the scale beyond the political cycle, uh, change at the scale of 20, 30, 40 years. And a lot of our work, I think, is setting that direction and emphasizing the fundamental changes that will need to be made for building the future that we want. Uh, we see that very clearly in the case of uh, energy, for example, and the work that Phoebe is leading uh, on uh, the energy transformation and the pathways to get to net zero by 2050. But I would say that every one of the six transformations in uh, education and innovation, uh, in the health and well-being, uh, in the industrial transformation, in sustainable land use, in sustainable cities, and in the digital transformation, should be viewed at this 10 to 30 year perspective to appreciate how deep is the change that we're really aiming for and therefore how different it is from a normal uh, political business cycle, uh, a normal uh, policy cycle. Uh, it's not a short-term initiative. Uh, it's not a, a one-time uh, investment to uh, address a problem or to patch up a problem. Uh, it is aiming to entrain our business, political, academic, and civil society sectors of broad society in the same direction and to help create a vision of where we want to be and then to create a process of how to get there. And in this regard, uh, it's to my mind a, a different kind of policy making and a different kind of politics and, and an exciting prospect if we can really help to bring it about because it is lengthening the time horizons, deepening the objectives, looking more holistically, looking at technological transformations, really a more imaginative and creative process than normal policy making. So that's the first point uh, I want to emphasize. And uh, please uh, let's think about ways to uh, support each of these uh, uh, national networks uh, in their championing of one of the transformations. And let's be meeting a lot uh, this coming year to <coughs> make this real. Just as Arato told us about the digital uh, initiatives in Cyprus, which are very, very exciting. That's so essential, the digital revolution, uh, that let's have some meetings uh, about that uh, and uh, try to scope out this uh, deep, transformative, longer term vision and how to get there. Uh, second point that for me is thrilling and basic uh, and very much in line with what uh, Julian uh, just said as well. This is truly Mediterranean wide and uh, that's exciting because these regions are really different. Uh, the uh, European, North Africa, uh, Eastern Mediterranean regions face different challenges. The indicators make this very clear, but it is one integrated region. For the Mediterranean to be healthy, we need uh, healthful societies all around the Mediterranean. 
and of course all of the countries share the vulnerabilities to the ecological changes to the pollution the overfishing uh, the direct uh, damages uh, taking place in the mediterranean sea itself uh, and also the benefits of interconnection uh, when it comes to renewable energy systems for example we really want to interconnect north africa with europe as we've talked about for decades but now as energy transformation is truly underway we need to turn those long-held ideas into practical realities so i would uh, like to encourage and emphasize every way that we can bring more colleagues from north africa uh, and from the middle eastern east mediterranean countries syria jordan uh, israel egypt uh, palestine into these active discussions with us uh, because i think that this is uh, really crucial and i don't think they're as deeply institutionalized as they should be budgets tend to stop uh, at the european boundary more or less except in very notable programs like uh, angelo's uh, prima program which is designed specifically for the mediterranean wide reach and we want more of that and we want each of the areas of the european green deal to include a mediterranean component that doesn't only stop in southern europe but includes the eastern mediterranean and north africa as well so i'm very excited about that and any ways in the coming year that we can deepen our consultations so that all of the countries that are in this report are also at the uh, now virtual table uh, we'll do it online no doubt but uh, at the virtual table will be a big plus and i think help us to move ahead and i firmly believe that also even in conflict zone areas like libya or in contested spaces uh, like Israel and Palestine, if we're thinking about practical issues of uh, climate, food production, energy systems, and so forth, we can get to practical answers uh, that move beyond uh, political uh, bottlenecks right now. I know it's not so easy, but I think that it's uh, probably the most important way to do that, uh, which is to focus on common interests and therefore practical solutions the third point that i would emphasize is how crucial is the european green deal right now it is in my view the best we have in the world of a transformation agenda that really looks at transformation in depth in scope in holism and in time dimension it's really well done uh, as I like to say, it's totally bureaucratic, but in the Weberian rational bureaucratic mold. Uh, in other words, uh, it's really thinking through systematic processes to make change uh, in uh, the, the best of the bureaucratic sense. Who has responsibility? Who needs to do what? What are the timelines? What are the processes? But it's not a plan. It's a process right now. The European Green Deal is not a plan. I want us to help fill in the plans uh, at the country level, at the regional level, uh, what really to do, because what the European Green Deal is, is a set of timelines, milestones, in an absolutely desirable, holistic approach, but it doesn't have underneath it the what to do in detail. And Europe still too much uh, then leaves the what to do at the country level uh, rather than really regional investment strategies. Uh, though that's getting better, it's still not enough in my view. We need regional energy system. Uh, we need uh, regional food uh, uh, production, distribution, use, uh, management system. We definitely need regional systems for the ecology of the region, for the health of uh, the Mediterranean Sea and so forth. So I think the European Green Deal is a huge plus and it is already having its global diplomatic effect. Definitely Europe brought uh, 
the East Asian countries into the recent announcements of China net climate neutrality by 2060. Japan, under new Prime Minister Suga, announcing very quickly uh, upon his uh, new prime ministership uh, uh, climate neutrality by 2050. Uh, Korea, the same. So we really have a lot of partners. And uh, once we pry Trump's finger from his Oval Office desk and carry that man out of uh, his office, uh, we're going to have a good president in the United States and there will be a U.S. Green Deal in effect uh, to join this. So I think we're going to have a lot of opportunity diplomatically for the European Green Deal to be applied first in the European uh, countries, the 27. I hope we can find ways to extend this to North Africa and the Eastern Mediterranean because it's a framework, uh, not only a European policy, but a, a very well-designed framework, and then as part of global diplomacy. And I'll uh, just end at that point to say that 2021 is potentially shaping up uh, as a breakthrough year. Uh, I don't think that's just a cliche. I think it's uh, actually real. Uh, this has been a very, very tough year uh, with COVID, with Trump, with uh, just a extraordinarily uh, difficult year. 2021 should be much better. Our governments by then first should figure out how to contain this pandemic. They've not quite done so, uh, unfortunately. That's why the second wave is so terrible. But the knowledge of what to do is much better. There will be vaccines coming, which will help, probably in mass use by the second half of 2021 uh, and partial use before then. That will help. There will be President Biden. That will help a lot because the madness from the United States was the greatest distraction to global policy making in the world in recent years. It just stopped logical thinking in the G20 and in so many other processes. That will improve dramatically. And colleagues, we have at least three major global uh, events next year that we should be uh, present at in a very active way. Uh, the first is COP15 of the Convention on Biological Diversity in Kunming, China in May, which should set ground rules for biodiversity conservation for years ahead. The second is the World Food System Summit uh, called by the UN and Secretary General uh, in the fall very important opportunity for us. And uh, if uh, the uh, SDSN Europe and uh, SDSN Mediterranean works closely with FAO, uh, WFP, the Rome-based institutions, I think we can end all of the initiatives that we have with Barilla and the food industry uh, and Regeneration 2030 you know, with uh, Andrea Illy we really can contribute to the World Food Summit in an important way. And then, of course, we have COP26 in Glasgow in November, which needs to be the time in which every country has committed to decarbonization by mid-century so that there finally is the global understanding and orientation of how to get to net zero in a timely way. This is all going to be on the agenda. I think we have a big leadership role to play because of your leadership uh, and uh, because of uh, Europe's uh, unique leadership role in, in the global agenda. And uh, this I find very promising. So let me uh, conclude where I started with great thanks for a wonderful report and a wonderful initiative. Uh, thanks to Angelo for your leadership on all of this. Uh, it's, it's a tremendous contribution and a, a very exciting one. Thank you.